Hello everyone and welcome back. We're now going to have our second inspirational talk of today. Jeff Mulgan is the Chief Executive Officer at Nesta in the UK. The foundation researches, funds and grows new ideas that can change the world. Before Nesta, he was Head of Strategy in the UK Government and has a new book out this month on collective intelligence called Big Mind. In this keynote, he'll talk about new ways of harnessing entrepreneurial energy to generate solutions. We're also going to have five minutes at the end for a Q&A, so if you'd like to submit any questions via the Ask and Vote section on the app, or we can use it the old-fashioned way afterwards, please do. Okay, for now, please Please put your hands together for Jeff Mulgan. Well, good, good afternoon, and thank you for being here, for having lasted through the afternoon. You are the people with stamina. Uh, you haven't given up. I don't know if my talk will be inspirational. You may find it annoying uh, or challenging, but hopefully there will be some different perspectives on the issues of smart uh, cities. So I should begin with a, a confession. Uh, I am a, a, uh, an enthusiast for technology. I have a, a PhD in telecoms. I like to see new things being solved. I like IBM Watson getting into health, deep mind sorting out energy, uh, all the possibilities of driverless cars and so on. I had a chat last week with a friend of mine who used to be a criminal who said when I showed this picture, ah, the Internet of Things, that will be the Internet of other people's things. Um, but I thought that was a bit unfair. I'm sure we will solve the problems of cybersecurity. And for many years, I've been an enthusiast too about the sort of things out there. Uh, smart cities, managing transport, energy, all the sort of sensors and flows and feedback systems we've been talking about. In fact, I first came to Barcelona 25 years ago for a conference on smart cards and how they were going to change cities. So in some ways, this is a long, long process we're seeing. What worries me is that for many people, the vision of the smart city isn't a very attractive one. It's one where we are either the victims of data being taken from us, of very top-down processes we have no say on, uh, decisions made in obscure places in city halls or corporations. And this is an era when the people are not very happy with things which are just done to them. They want sometimes to take back control, to have a say, uh, to have a voice. So what I want to talk about today are some other ideas about the smart city and maybe a slightly different definition of what a smart city is. So for me, a smart city is one that harnesses the full potential of human and machine intelligence to meet its wants and needs. That's what we should really be aspiring to. And if you picture yourself in 20 or 30 years' time, maybe sitting on a rocking chair looking back, my guess is that's what you'll wish you'd been working on now not things which are just technically interesting, and, but don't necessarily meet true wants and needs. Um, my organization, Nesta, as, as we heard, has, works as an investor, doing projects of all kinds. About two years ago, we did a, a, a study looking at smart cities, both from the top down and the bottom up and from the middle. Interestingly, then, Barcelona was very much in the top down mode, and one of the really fascinating things to see here is how Barcelona's approach to smart cities has become much more sophisticated, top-down, bottom-up, horizontal. I won't go through this now. Instead, I'm going to talk through four different dimensions of the smart city, which I think are going to become much more imp important in the years ahead. So the first is about smart humans as well as machines. In a way, this is obvious. But I'm not just talking about having good education, which clearly is important in any city. I want to make two much narrower points. About a year and a half ago, in the US, a group of economists did probably the most important study on innovation that's been done in recent years. They looked at a million inventors in America, people who had created patents for the sort of things we see out there, and tried to understand where they'd come from. 
And the picture they showed is that you were much more likely to become an inventor if you had early experience of invention, if your parents worked in technology, if your parents were, were wealthy enough to give you things to play with. And the economists concluded that the US was wasting a huge amount of potential and talent because so many young Americans got no experience of tinkering, hacking, making things. And they recommended a big shift of industrial policy from venture capital incentives and the sort of traditional tools into investing and giving young children from five onwards experience of making things. So for me, point number one is that any vision of the smart city should include the sort of maker spaces Barcelona has or Rome that China is investing huge amounts in, should be giving kids chances to play with things like Raspberry Pis to be makers of the digital world, not just consumers of Facebook pressing like or, or don't like. And this is very feasible. Nesta in the UK runs a, a big open process for 11 to 16-year-olds inventing Internet of Things technologies. But when we look around the world, this is still only a tiny minority of children are getting a chance to be makers and shapers. So point one is make sure your city is doing this sort of stuff at scale for children. The other issue, of course, is what's going to happen to jobs in the next 20 years. A few weeks ago, we published what we think is the biggest study on the US and the UK looking at the likely effect of automation on jobs. Which jobs will shrink, which will grow, which ones will change their shape. I won't go through the detail of this. This is one summary sort of infographic of some of the sectors which will shrink, some of the ones which are likely to grow, which range from health and teaching to sports and hospitality. But perhaps the most important thing is what we saw were the skills likely to be in greater demand in 10 or 15 years' time after a wave of AI and automation and smart tools has gone through the economy. And these are, these are the ones which come out from the analysis. This is the US and UK, but it's probably not much different in other countries. It's things like fluency of ideas, creativity of all kinds is the ability to think systemically. It's sort of the critical thinking, problem-solving skills, which we all know in our daily lives are the most important ones. And yet, in school curriculums, these are largely absent. They've been squeezed out by, by other things. So the other thing I'd say, if any smart city, if these sort of things are not at the heart of what's happening in schools and universities, then you have no claim to be a smart city in any serious way. And interestingly, nearly all of these things are learned by doing real-life projects in teams with other people, not just sitting in a classroom being talked at by a teacher. So the second big theme, and we had some fantastic session earlier this afternoon on this, was a smart city has to be made up of active, not passive citizens, who are making it and shaping it as adults. And I think there's many dimensions of this, and we've had huge progress in the last 10 years. So one dimension is about entrepreneurship. Every year we do a digital city index for Europe. It will come out in a few weeks' time, the 2017 one. For some strange reason, the computer for this slide has started the list at Madrid, number 14. Barcelona is, of course, higher up the list, uh, um, as you can see by the size of the circles. Anyway, this is an analysis of the conditions in each city for creating a digital startup, for scaling it up, access to capital, access to advice, access to space, and so on. And we're beginning to see far better conditions for digital entrepreneurship right across Europe and right across the world of this kind. And if you're interested, uh, we've published a, an ideas... Ah, okay. An ideas bank for local policymakers, which draws on the best examples from around the world of how cities are creating space for people to be entrepreneurs of all kinds, social, commercial, creative. Uh, and I'd strongly urge you to look at this. It's, it's been taken up by lots of cities around the world. It's a fantastic summary of the state of the world's sort of genius at helping its own genius. Another side of this is data. So we have many data tools which suck in data from sensors of all kinds, but there's also a movement of citizen-generated data. Here in Barcelona, we had Smart Citizen, which was for people to measure air quality. 
And this example on the slide is from Indonesia, Peta Jakarta, where citizens monitor flood conditions alongside the municipality so as to get a real-time picture of what's happening, which is much more efficient than the local government could do on its own. And as you'll know, there are literally thousands now of citizen-generated data projects across the world. These were not part of the smart city agenda at all 10 years ago. There's then a whole flood of projects on digital social innovation, some on open data, open hardware, like Raspberry Pi, Arduino, or, 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 uh, and others like Safecast. Use of open knowledge, open networks, Guifi from Catalonia. And if you're interested, about 2,000 organizations across Europe now collaborate, sharing experiences as digital social innovators. Their challenge, though, is that in most cases, city governments are not very good at working with them, don't understand what they do, don't talk to them. And again, a key challenge for the next few years is getting much better at that municipal city relationship with digital social innovation. Seoul in Korea, where I chair a committee for the mayor, is, I think, an outstandingly good example of being really good on the hardware, the highest broadband speeds on earth, but also a huge emphasis on linking up with civil society and digital social innovators too. And this is an example from Seoul. Their open testbed for the Internet of Things, I think, is a really good example of opening up the creation of the smart city to residents. So significant residential communities are being turned into living laboratories for everything from parking sensors to energy to waste tools, but allowing the public to be participants in the creation of the future city. I'm not aware of anywhere else in the world which has quite gone as far at integrating these concepts into sort of the democratic life of a city. And the other thing they're doing in Seoul resonates with Barcelona and Madrid and other cities, which is next generation democracy. Uh, in the session earlier this afternoon, we were hearing about what's been done here uh, through uh, the platform on the city and in Decide Madrid to really turn government into a shared collaboration of citizens and state. So you can propose ideas, you can comment, you can vote, and politicians, elected politicians and citizens, co-create the governance of the city. Paris is doing this on a large scale with participatory budgeting. Nearly 200,000 people have taken part this year. 10% of it is, again, set aside for children to decide on spending decisions. So you cultivate a community which is good at using power and taking power. And all of the tools from Descent, which we worked on at Nesta with Barcelona and others, these are all open source tools. Anyone can use them, adapt them for a political party, a city, or a national government. The third point is a slightly more technical one. It's about complementary innovation. If you read the history of technologies like the car or electricity, it's very interesting their full impact only came when the original technology was complemented by other innovations, including social innovations and institutional ones. So the first cars came around in the 1880s, but then it was only when we invented things like garages, driving schools, road markings, and in the end, things like speed bumps and so on, and then suburbs and supermarkets, that all of the benefits of the car and some of their disbenefits were realized. And I think exactly the same is true of many of the technologies of the smart city. They will only have their full effect on society and productivity if we design complementary innovations, otherwise they'll be crushed. Now, two examples of this. One is drones. Later this week, we announce in the UK a partnership of national government, my organization, the main cities, and the regulators to create living test beds for drones, to work out in practice how do you design a city to cope with lots and lots of drones doing retail deliveries or ambulances or health services and so on? What do you do about noise, about visual pollution, about charging mechanisms, about the data coming from the drones to say where they are? All of these remain to be invented. Uh, but the cities which do this best will be the ones which get the full benefit of technologies like drones and AVs ahead of the others. But you have to think in a systems way, not just in terms of the technology. And the other example of this is around um, data. 
if I can get this to work. So one of the projects we're collaborating on now with Barcelona and Amsterdam and some other cities is creating new platforms for data where citizens can control their own data and decide where the data goes. And this is one of many innovations being developed around the world really to help us navigate our way to an economy, a society where data is so important, so valuable, so crucial. Uh, and this may not end up being the answer, but if there isn't that kind of complementary innovation, we won't get much of the benefit of the smart city world. And there are many other examples of these kinds. The fourth area I want to talk about is one I've seen almost nothing of uh, here at this fair, which is about livingness. So one of the fears for me of the smart city always was that it would make cities simple and slightly dead. A few weeks ago, I visited Songdo, New Songdo in Korea, which used to be held up as the model smart city. Has anyone in this room been there? Quite a few of you. Wow, this is an unusual audience. I don't know what you thought. To me, that was a pretty dead city. You know, compare it to Barcelona. Barcelona is bursting with life, with complexity, with richness, with messiness, with humanity. It looks much more like the natural environments we are at home in, which are, again, uneven. They're not lots of repeated regularities. They're, they're, they're complicated. And I think the, the best vision of the future smart city is one which is full of machines which are alive, which react to us, which have character, which are slightly unpredictable, slightly quirky. There's a wonderful arts project I saw um, a few months ago which had artificial intelligence chairs. And you'd walk up to the chair and it would kind of do a little dance in response to you. And it was a very different aesthetic of technology than the sort of almost invisible, cool, sort of lifeless versions we often get. And I think we're going to see a, a radical change in really the, the aesthetic of the smart city coming mainly from the arts. So here's one example. These are uh, a sort of swarm, um, sort of mini drones being used as art installations. And they're just one of many examples of using very advanced technology to make a city feel more alive, more surprising, more dynamic. But as you can see, they look much more like nature. They don't look like a tower block. Or a, or a machine, and they have some of the swarm properties of birds or insects or something like that. And again, around the world, this interface of AI, art, VR, and so on is creating extraordinary new most pictures of a more living version of the future, not a less living one. Here's another one, the tree of Tenere. Swarm algorithms, you have to actually see it to understand a bit what's going on there. But again, it's trying to design in, using algorithms and machine learning around the algorithms, different kinds of nature, different kinds of environment which feel uh, more, at, more, well, more welcoming to us as human beings. So my encouragement for anyone who is a designer of smart cities or a commissioner is yes, some of the piping, the infrastructure, and so on, that in a way has to be a bit uh, so linear, logical, methodical, and a bit dull. Um, but make sure there's above the ground a very different vision of the smart city, which is alive, which is interactive, which is messy, quirky, full of character, full of personality, a bit more like sort of cats and dogs and birds than it is like... Um, like machines. And the city of Lima has a fantastic example of this, which you may know of, where they've, for the last two years, used vultures armed with GoPro cameras to go around monitoring people dumping waste. And the vultures turn out to be really good at this, and they then stream from the GoPro cameras live on the web. And four million people have watched these streams. And it's a sort of weird combination of so animal creatures and high technology and the public, which everyone, of course, thinks is quite fun as well as being quite smart. But it comes out of a different kind of imagination than what we've often had in the smart city debate. Now, some of these things, if you're interested, here is an absolutely shameless plug for my book, which, as Georgie said, is out this month from Princeton University Press, which is an attempt at putting together a lot of the examples of large-scale collective intelligence, some from things like NASA or Wikipedia, 
uh, some emerging around artificial intelligence. But I think our new tools of technology are forcing us to think in a new way about how does thinking happen at a large scale? How do we observe a whole city? How can a whole city be creative? How does it organize its memory? All of these things. And if you're interested, this book is an attempt at sort of crystallizing what we've learned, but also what might be a new discipline, a new field which doesn't really yet exist in our universities, in our companies, which is good at doing both the machine intelligence bit and the human intelligence bit at the same time. So to summarize, Imagine your future self, 20, 30 years time, sitting in your rocking chair, looking back on your life. And what will you be proud of to have contributed to making your city smart? I hope it will be a vision of smart humans as well as machines, not a world where our machines are brilliant, but we are left dumb and unemployed. That is not a very happy future. One where the people of the city, again, are not just passive observers to things done to them, but are makers and shapers and active. A city where we've been smart in developing the complementary innovations, so our main innovations are not blocked, and where our city is more alive. And finally, one where what we end up with is a more complex city, not a simpler one. And I think the single biggest mistake of some of the visions of the smart city is they wanted to simplify the city. They wanted to turn the crazy messiness of a London or a Sao Paulo or a Johannesburg and make it neat like an engineering diagram. Now that's fine for water or energy, electricity, but it's not actually fine for a city. A true 21st century smart city actually embraces the complexity, the differentiation, the mess. If anything, it enhances them. And that leaves us a city much more like the nature we were evolved to thrive in which is a bit messy, a bit organic, a bit chaotic, uh, but also provides us somewhere in which we can feel truly at home. So I hope that may have given you some food for thought. I'm sure that will have annoyed some of you. And hopefully, in the spirit of what I was saying, we have a little bit of time for some questions or commentary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Do you want to take a seat? Brilliant talk, and I love this concept of quirky machines. I just want to kick things off by saying, how on earth do you create quirky machines? Because surely everybody is just wanting to fine tune the process, and city planning in its very nature can sometimes be about that, about sort of taking away that mess. You talk about bringing in the art world. Do you need to encourage artists to do that more, or are they sort of finding that as their subject anyway? Well, I think there's, there's two or three overlapping um, trends which many of you are probably involved in. Some is about arts. So it's, it's commissioning artists to think through, through installations, the next generation of data or AI, and almost automatically they create these slightly weird, characterful uh, objects which respond to you or interact with you in not very machine-like ways. The second trend is around emotionally intelligent machines which has been a, a huge push in Japan in particular uh, and is now spreading across uh, North America and Europe because we recognize any machines we interact with, providing perhaps care or teaching or even perhaps a, a robocop on the street, they have to be quite smart in being able to read yeah, your, your eyes, your, your lips, what your mood is, and perhaps be a bit smarter about how to comfort you, how to make you less stressed. Uh, and so, you know, playing with a, a, a street a street light which can spot someone walking past who's incredibly tensed up and about to hit someone and might even know some way to respond which would just calm them down a little. That's the sort of other place we're going with, I think, next generation machine intelligence. So it's, it's quirky, it's more emotionally sophisticated, but I think the key is it's trying to become more human in order to be more useful for us as humans. Whereas 10 or 20 years ago, most of the push in AI development was almost to reinforce the non-human side of machines, and that's sometimes the right thing to do, but the more they are part of our lives, the, the more we, we find, feel uncomfortable with machines which are too machine-like. I'm going to go for a question from the app here, which slightly leads on from that. It says, when is the funding going for content instead of platforms? There are enough platforms already. 
Wow, well, that's a very big um, <laughs> question about the digital uh, economy. As you will probably all be aware in this room, you know, the, the dominant companies of the world together today by capitalization and everything else are platforms. Uh, almost none of them create any content. So the Facebooks and Googles in particular, you know, benefit from content but don't produce it. So one of the, the great issues of, of this decade is really going to be, is that a problem which can be fixed? Uh, President Macron uh, has proposed in Europe what, will, what might end up as a tax on the platforms in order to redirect money into creating news or creating drama or creating music. And if I had to guess, I think that will happen. I think France and Germany in particular will, uh, will lead it. If that, I'm not sure that's what the questioner was no, getting at. But I think we will see a big shift of power and money from the platforms which are so dominant into reinforcing uh, content. And of course, fake news is driving that more than anything else. The sense that the, you know, the business models of the platforms means not only are they parasitic on content from others, but they reinforce and amplify the worst kind of content or amplify the worst side of human nature, not the best. Are there any questions from the floor? Yes. Gentleman there, and is there? A, I don't know if he's leaving. Yes, please. Okay, I'm holding in my head the uh, advertising of uh, Big Mind. You gave me in the speaker room, just uh, you know, you cross. Um, my question is I mean, you have a very good uh, uh, presentation, but I wonder you didn't mention a uh, specific uh, population which are the excluded one and underclass. I think what you have uh, explained us is applying to, uh, let's say, uh, young generation who are doing a lot with uh, technology and know how to use the, these machines and the apps, whatever. I wonder what uh, is the influence or how those communities are engaged with all these um, citizens and machines that you um, defined smart city. Mm. Um, oh. Can I just also yeah. add in, because um, this is the most popular question, which I think um, sort of complements that, is are smart cities only for younger generations? Well, let me give some, some practical examples, because um, I think the answer is no. Uh, one of the biggest areas of work at Nesta is around long-term health conditions and the relatively elderly. And one of the things we've been seeing in the last few years is the creation of large groups of patients coming together to take control of data to become more active within the health system. Even dementia is an example. We helped set up a thing called Dementia Citizens, which links together people with dementia and their carers to pool data on what is or isn't working in their lives, the effect of diet or music or dancing, and to see what the impact is on their well-being and mobility. And there are similar things in Parkinson's, diabetes, many other health conditions. So I see no reason nowadays why the relatively old should be excluded from this, but it needs to become more of a priority. At the other end of the age spectrum, uh, one of the other projects we're working on is smart labor markets. What can we do to harness data across a city to help young people make choices about uh, exams, sorry, about subjects and careers? And if you're interested, a few weeks ago, we published a, almost a, 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 it's both a vision of where that could go, but also living examples of things you could use as a young person or a job seeker to find out what jobs you could get, how much they pay, what your career opportunities are, and so on. This should have been part of Smart Cities years ago, but those sort of social needs you mentioned have not been at the forefront of the investment at all. And they need to be now because they can be transformative. And the final group is refugees. So Europe has had millions of refugees come in. Uh, many years ago, I did a lot of research with refugees. And I remember being quite surprised to discover for refugees in Britain, the mobile phone was the single most valuable thing they had. Many were willing to not eat for one or two days to keep their mobile phone. 
And the last year or two has seen a fantastic sort of collaboration of the tech industry to find new ways of providing solutions for refugees around identity or money transfer or help into jobs. But I, really, I, I totally agree with the grain of your question. These issues have been largely absent from the smart city agenda for the last 10, 20 years. And yet these are the things which, where probably the biggest difference to people's lives could be made. I just forgot to mention that I'm subscribed to Nesta. I enjoy all the articles. Thank you. <laughs> as, as am I. Um, Jeff Mulgan, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Um, but thank you very much for your talk. Round of applause for Jeff Mulgan. Thank you. Thank you.